Matthew chapter 17 is where we're going to spend our time today. It is Communion Sunday. We're going to celebrate the Eucharist, the sacrament of what it means to be joined together by the blood of the Lamb, the sacrifice of the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are a people who are here not because of our own doing, but we are here because of the strict grace, mercy, and generosity of God. How many of you are glad that God is a generous God? God is... God gives us blessings that we didn't know we need. God introduces us to folks that we did not know we needed in our life to encourage us, to remind us that uh, our connectedness, our connectivity, our ability to be in relationship with one another is at the root of what it means to access blessings and strength and peace and the virtues that make us faithful to God's work in the world and certainly within ourselves. And so uh, I am certainly grateful that this journey to Easter, this, this, this six weeks, if you will, of, of spending this time together uh, with our eyes and our mind beginning to be set towards <clears throat> what is known as the highest of holy days in the Christian tradition. It is uh, worth saying that there certainly is a, a, a special marker of both Christmas Day and Easter. Uh, and if I were to throw another day in there, Pentecost Sunday, uh, of these, you know, routine of Sundays, if you will, these three days carry a very significant uh, theological and experiential grounding for us as followers of the way of Jesus. Matthew chapter 17 uh, is uh, the record of Jesus uh, literally gathering his disciples together uh, to prepare them for his, his death and perhaps and even more the aftermath of his death. Uh, what I appreciate about following Jesus is that Jesus kind of, you know, We'll give you a little heads up from time to time of the things that are to, that is to come. Uh, I like to be surprised sometimes, but I also like to get little teasers so when the surprise happens, I can look back on something as almost a bookmark to spark my memory that, yes, this is indeed the fulfillment of what has been spoken to me. I don't know if you've ever been in prayer times with God. I don't know if you've ever been in some meditation times. And, and you get a little glimpse of something that seems extraordinary, something that, you know, tantalizes your imagination, but you just don't think, you know, that this is really going to happen. And then all of a sudden it happens and it kind of brings you back to that prayer time brings you back to that time where you made a request and God actually delivered on that prayer. Anybody had that experience before? Well, I do think that this passage of scripture, among many others, gives us an opportunity to see how God seeks to prepare God's people when God is getting ready to do something special. And uh, I know for many of us, we come to church a lot and we may hear all the time that God's getting ready to do something special. Uh, it may sound cliche and it may sound uh, overused, uh, and perhaps it is. It just means that God is up to doing special things in your life, and God never gets tired of blessing God's people. Matthew chapter 17, uh, let's look at verse number one. We will uh, read the first nine verses uh, and uh, see how the biblical text speaks to us as we make this journey to Resurrection Sunday. Six days Later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and James' brother, John, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. And suddenly there appeared to all of them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. 
And while Peter was still speaking, suddenly a bright, bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a voice said, this is my son, the beloved. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground, overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. Amen. I, I, I'm going to talk about mountaintop experiences. Mountaintop experiences. God, thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and the hearers of your word. And we'll say, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. May all the people of God say, amen. Now, mountains, hills, elevated spaces and places in the biblical text are very significant. Whenever you are reading the Bible, reading a particular passage where you are seeing the introduction or the elevation, the next big step that is being taken by a significant figure in the text, it is very likely they have had to have a mountain top experience. Uh, when you go into the scriptures, whether it's with Abraham, whether it's with uh, 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 Moses or, or, or Jacob or, or, or any of these kind of earliest of figures, uh, as they seek to either lean into taking the next step with God, or as they seek to try and have an encounter with God. They are usually finding themselves going up a mountain. Uh, there's a song we used to sing back in the day, said, I'm going up the rough side of a mountain. And the song you say, and I'm just going to hold to God unchanging hand that the mountain uh, elevated place is often a very important marker for you and I a precursor for you and I to appreciate that if I can just make it up the mountain there may be something waiting for me that I could not experience in the valley you know, uh, many of the Psalms that we read, the book of Psalms, have uh, liturgies and, and, and lyrics that are always gifted to the children of Israel as they made their pilgrimage to the temple. Uh, the temple, the city of Jerusalem, it always was set up on a mountain. And, you know, there was some kind of uh, military benefit for a city or a significant piece of property to be set up on a mountain because it meant that if someone was trying to come and attack you, you could always see them coming. I don't know how many of you watch Game of Thrones or, you know, so, some of these these wild shows, praise God. I was on the way back from where I was traveling at, and I, I, I stumbled back into House of Dragon. I had a six-hour flight, and so I skipped the first three episodes because, you know, it was just didn't, wasn't making wasn't, wasn't enough action for me. So I finally, you know, got to the last few, and, and it, it, it was just fascinating to me as I was thinking about this message how all of these castles, these, these enclosed cities were usually at the top of a mountain. And, and as they militarily tried to figure out how to take siege of a place, they had to figure out how we gonna get 
into this, this sea or into this defensed city or castle without us being seen. Mountains, they are both places of elevation and they also serve as a defense. Well, as we journey to Easter, I want to invite you to think about your journey. As we get closer and closer to the high point of our Christian liturgical celebrations of Easter and Resurrection Sunday, I want you to think about the journey that is necessary for us. As we get closer to continuing to reflect on what does it mean to approach a place where death is awaiting us and yet we have an expectation because we've been through this a few times that Resurrection Sunday is coming. That part of the journey to get to resurrection requires us to go through a very low place, a difficult place, a place that none of us are really like excited to run to. I mean, part of the human uh, survival mechanism, if you will, is to always resist danger. If you met somebody who's just like, you know, running into dangerous places, you kind of be like, man, you, you kind of reckless. I don't know if I want to spend that much time with you. I don't know if you've ever been in a car with somebody that, you know, make you wish you walked. <laughs> Praise God. Like, I, I want to get to my destination, but not like this. Praise God, because I want to get there alive. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever tried to walk through life and you realize that some of the sojourners on your journey don't seem very risk averse. And you sitting here trying to figure out, man, you know, I, 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 I want to make it to be 25 and... You know, I had a vision and a dream about, you know, retirement age. The journey to resurrection feels very anticipatory and something to look forward to. But along the way, resurrection requires a rough journey. And I want you to appreciate, child of God, that all of us, everybody say all of us, cannot get to resurrection without going through the mountains. You can do all the tricks you want. You can have all the nice, you know, uh, 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 everything, you know, take all the right classes, you know, Write your goals. What what'd you call that we do at the beginning of the year? Ma ma vision board. Mm -hmm. You can do all that. <laughs> vision board yourself <laughs> to life. You can do all that. But how many know that there will be moments in your journey where you will hit the rough side of the mountain? Mountains are necessary for your mat maturation as a follower of Jesus. Because as you journey up the mountain, you begin to appreciate that there is a level of discipline required to get there safely. We are going through this whole year, and again, we are trying to rebuild the muscles of our Christian discipleship by focusing on those disciplines, those practices that don't eliminate your problems, but they give you the strength you need to go through them. You see, it's hard to go through a problem when you don't have the strength. It don't make the problem go away. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it matter of fact, some of us, and I'm one of those from time to time, have felt like throwing in the towel. 
Because, you know, I'd be like, God, you think I'm built for this, but I'm clearly not. At least not today. God says, that's because you, you ain't made it up the rough side of the mountain yet. But if you can keep pushing yourself to engage in the training of your soul and spirit to go up the rough side of the mountain, there's something at the top of that mountain that you need to experience that you won't be able to access by staying at the base. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, was, I was, you know, in Cairo, Egypt, and I drove, you know, I landed in Egypt. This was, had to be two years ago it was during my birthday in 20, what is 23, 21. And, you know, I decided to go to Egypt. And, and you know, uh, I, I, I didn't know that uh, in order for me to get uh, to, to, to Mount Sinai, I wanted to take the trip up the mountain. I may have said this a few times before. I don't know. All right. And, 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 and what I recall is, is, is that in order for me to get there, I had to literally drive all night. I landed at 7 p.m. and I was trying to get there before a, a stretch of highway shut down, a three-hour drive, but we missed the window, and so we literally had to take the long way. It took us six hours. So I'm sleeping in a little old car, back and neck, neck and back hurting. But I was so committed to getting to Mount Sinai, I wanted to take a trip up the mountain. And there were other folks making that trip up the mountain. Some were walking slow. Some were walking fast. Some were taking lots of breaks along the way. And I didn't make it all the way up the mountain, but as far as I made it, my body began to literally shake because I had pushed myself as far as I could go. And although I didn't make it all the way to the top of the mountain, there was at the, the, the like three quarters point, an altar that had been carved into the mountain, like a little cave. And I went in that cave just to sit down and rest because my legs were shaking. My, I thought I was going to pass out. And as I, as I sat down and began to look inside the cave, there were prayers written on little pieces of paper that people had carved into the mountain and rolled up their prayers and pushed them into the mountain. And I just appreciated that God always makes a resting place even when you can't get all the way to the top. That along your journey, God will give you reprieve. God is not punishing you because you may not have what it takes to get all the way to the top. Why? Because it is not the destination that God is preoccupied with. It is your journey. What is happening to you and I as we go up the rough side of a mountain? What is God working in us as we take one step after another? What is God working out of us as we take one step after another? And dare I say, what is the encounter God would have us to engage and experience when we reach the moment and the point where we can, through our own strength, go no further? Well, this is what we find in the passage. God brings uh, several disciples, Peter, James, and John. Jesus uh, had his own kind of inner circle, if you will. Jesus had 12 disciples. He had folk that, you know, hung out with him everywhere he went. But Jesus knew even among the 12 that he needed a little smaller intimate group of folk that would take that extra next step. I don't know why Peter, James, and John made the cut. If you read this uh, account in another passage, the scripture says that they made it to the top of the mountain. Jesus asked them to pray and they fell asleep. Which just tells me that even when Jesus picks us out of a crowd, sometimes he sees more in us than we see in ourselves. Sometimes God picks you out of a crowd, not because you are fully uh, qualified, not because you are fully put together, but God will pick you out of a crowd because God understands that your heart is right. Your, your, your will, your, your desire is to please the Lord. 
And as you get to some of these secret places with God, Lord, have mercy, that even when you fall asleep, God will allow you to experience something that you would never imagine just because you came along for the ride. And I want you to know, child of God, on this way to Easter Sunday, some of us need to make sure that we don't fall asleep. Dare I say that we don't stay asleep. I know wokeness has become now this politicized word. I mean, I find it so interesting how much of the cultural creations of, you know, folks of color, black folks, Latino folk, Asian folk, you know, poor folk, these, these idioms can become our own special kind of language to one another. And then folks will seize on that and weaponize it and turn it into something none of us even intended it to be. I, 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 was, I, was, I, was, uh, I was speaking in Oklahoma City. You know, this is the, you know, not the bastion of all that one would consider to be progressive and liberal it's it by its own admission with great pride is a place where folks are trying to make america great again <laughs> and trying to you know turn the clock back to a time when they say life was so simple you know when black folk had to drink from water fountains you know we couldn't go sit inside and they of course wouldn't focus on that part you know no we don't mean that we just mean everything else about that time. You know, like when, you know, uh, uh, we, we couldn't own land. Oh, but not that part. It's everything else. And I'd be asking them, so which, which part of that time did you like it? That was good for me. <laughs> they passing laws now where they aren't allowing folk to teach black history in the schools. They are passing laws now where they won't extend medical uh, services to trans children, young people and families. I'm trying to ask myself, man, I told the folk in Oklahoma, you know, the only thing that you ought to fear if you are living in the past is time. Because time has a way of making however you fit in the past gives you an honest kind of accounting of how you will be viewed in the future. I mean, just think of all the folks who lived in the past time really holding on to something that they just knew was true. And then 25 years later, they won't even admit that that's what they was doing. That's why they're trying to take some of this stuff out the schools. Because, you know, Jerry Jones, you know, good lesson of how history sneaks up and finds you. Jerry Jones, a billionaire. He's, you know, got to be, you know, some of y'all don't know Jerry. Jerry Jones, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys. Billionaire, multi-billionaire. One of the richest fellas in the whole world. Owns the team that they call America's team. And yet, somebody dug up a picture. Wasn't even looking for Brother Jerry. They focusing on the little black girls and boys trying to integrate a school in Arkansas. And there you see Brother Jerry. Pre-billionaire Brother Jerry. He says he's 14, 15 years old, Brother Jerry. Standing there on the steps with all the folk terrorizing the young black kids, trying to get into the school. And he could not outrun history. You see, part of what I want to believe is that for some of us, being woke is not about becoming a special interest, you know, uh, 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 you know focusing on the, on the special interest uh, issues of the day at all costs. But what it is is about you always being open to how God will update you. <laughs> Pat yourself on the chest and say, I need an update, praise God. I mean, God is not changing. I want you to understand that. But how many know some of us need an update? We all got these nice phones. 
some, somebody got a phone. And your phone, with all this great technology, if you don't get the software update, it may work, but it may work slowly. You may not be able to access all of the features. You may be able to operate at the most basic function. But if you don't hit the software update, ain't no failure in the phone. You just need to get an update. How many know God? I want you to hear me on this now. This, this may uh, you know, ruffle some of our feathers. It ruffles minds from time to time, I must admit. God, the eternal, all-knowing one who has been around before time began and will outlast every one of us, God never needs an update. I want you to trip off this. When the church says slavery was okay, God did not need to be updated that it was wrong. When the world thought, that the earth was flat. God did not need an update. <laughs> when, when, when the church was burning folk at the stake or, or when we were, uh, you know, engaging in imperialism, not we, us in here, but humanity engaging in imperialism, God did not need an update. Like, oh, you know what? I think, you know, we shouldn't be, folks shouldn't be killing folk. How many know some of us got to acknowledge that we are still catching up to God. And there are moments, listen, where God will bring you to a mountaintop experience to give you an extra glimpse into how grand God is and how small we are. God took three of his disciples, Jesus did, up the mountain. And they get to the top of the mountain, and because these three were chosen out of the 12, they got to see a part of Jesus that no one else had seen. It wasn't that Jesus did not have, according to our theological descriptions and understanding of who Jesus was, Jesus was what, the, what we believe the fullness of God dwelling in a body. That the most you can get of God stuffed inside a body without that body just disintegrating into nothingness, that's what Jesus was. We say that Jesus was fully human and fully divine. That Jesus was not like, you know, half human and half divine. Jesus literally had the fullness of humanity and the fullness of divinity all stuffed up into one body. That, that the fullness of God was cloaked by the fullness of humanity. And Jesus was literally spending time with things that he was uh, uh, present at the beginning of creation. What do you think about this? I, I, I like, you know, sometimes taking the girls, we go up to, to watch the, 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 the sunset. And we drive by trees, trees that have been here for thousands of years. And I'd be saying to myself, man, this tree was here when the creator of the tree walked on the planet. Can you imagine what that tree, if a tree had feelings, I'm sure it had a little something. When Jesus is walking over in Palestine, that the trees all the way over here on this side of the world felt God walking on the earth. Woo. Have you sending chills to my, my body? Like, man, every step Jesus took, it reverberated everywhere. That Jesus is God in the flesh. But the disciples could only see with their eyes the manifestation of what Jesus allowed them to see. When Jesus would heal the sick, they would see, wow, I've never seen nothing like that before. When Jesus walked on water, wow, I've never seen nothing like that before. When Jesus fed the 5,000, wow, I've never seen glimpses that maybe you could, you know, describe away. Oh, you know, he must be learned in the sciences of sorcery. He must have did metaphysics, made, made an eye trick. You know, any of y'all ever seen any magicians? Make you make tricks with your eyes, make you think things that happened that didn't happen. Well, Jesus, you know, did things half full scratching the head. But when they made it to the top of the mountain, 
The scripture says that Jesus began to transfigure. What is the transfiguration moment? In the text, it is literally the unfold, the, the, the opening of Jesus' humanity so the divinity can fully express itself. It was so significant of an experience that the scripture says they all fell down on the ground and began to worship him. They had an experience at the top of the mountain that was very different than anything they had seen in other places of Jesus' ministry and walk. What does it say to you and I that God will lead you to places on your journey through hard times? Upsize of the rough mountain that if you and I could just stay on the journey that God may show you something that is so significant that will cause you to fall to the ground and worship acknowledging I've seen and experienced something I've never seen before. And what I've seen I can't describe. I can't chalk that up to some tricks, mind playing tricks on me. I can't chalk that up to, 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 to some special magic. No, there's something that is so resonant with what I've seen Jesus do. Now I'm actually beholding the fullest expression of who Jesus has been giving me a little bit here and there, who he is. The significance of a mountaintop experience is that however you make your journey up the mountain, you will get to a moment in your journey where God will make a believer out of you. God will convince you that this journey is worth staying on. God will convince you that it's worth taking another step. God will convince you that if you just stay close to me, I will show you things that you've never imagined. God won't take away all your problems because guess what? Peter, James, and John, they still end up having to get persecuted for their faith. They still got martyred, meaning they still died. They ain't walking around here still today because they saw the transfiguration. But they became so bold in their faith that they carried with them a testimony. Guess what? Jesus told them like this. Listen, don't tell anybody what you've seen until after I've risen from the dead. Now, for us, that, you know, that washes off our back because we kind of know how the story ends. <laughs> but you got to ask yourself, Jesus, you're asking me not to say anything about what just happened until you rise from the dead? That's different. It's not like, you know, until I die. <laughs> Keep this secret till I die. Okay, Jesus, this is quite a secret, though. I mean, I'm just here, like, kicking here with Elijah and kicking here with Moses. I mean... I guess I can hold that till you die. Jesus said, no, not till I die, till I rise from the dead. Jesus was planting a seed in them that they were not even aware of. Why? Because Jesus wants to keep teasing you into faith and faithfulness. He wants to keep giving you glimpses of things that you yourself would not expect. Why? Because part of God's journey with us is to keep expanding what we know to be possible in our life and in our vocation. Peter, James, and John traveling up a rough side of a mountain, get to the top of the mountain, see something they've never seen, and then they come down the mountain, the scripture says, holding on to a secret that they had to wait until the right time 
to share with the world. I just want you to be mindful, beloved, that as you make your journey, you're not supposed to tell everybody everything. <laughs> Some folk don't deserve an insight into what God has shown you. There are some folks that do. There are probably folks that's in your prayer, you know, group. Folk that have the kind of wild, crazy faith that you have. But some folk, when they show you that they like to, you know, point out the gray clouds on a sunny day, you don't need to share with them the revelations, the glimpses, the, the sneak peeks into what God is up to. Hold the secret until it's time. Why? Because that secret, that, that revelation from God is the fuel we will need to stay on the journey up the rough side of the mountain. Your journey, child of God, up the rough side of the mountain, there's a experience waiting for you. There's some words waiting for you. There's some strength waiting for you. There's even some futuristic uh, uh, insight waiting for you. But you got to be willing to make the journey up the rough side of the mountain. And along the way, you got to be willing to engage in the practices that keep expanding you and updating you and and awakening the muscles inside you that have atrophied from just the lack of engagement. But if you can keep pushing up the rough side of the mountain, I think that resurrection can continue to be within our grasp. And if you're like me, I need God to keep raising some dead things in my life. If you're like me, I need God to keep shining a light on the places where light seems to be absent. If you're like me, I need God to keep teasing my mind and helping me to know that there's more to this than what you see. I need God to keep reminding me that God is faithful and that God is good and that God is able and that God won't let me down. I need God to keep expanding me. Because only if God expands me can I begin to experience the fullness of what God has in store. And guess what? If the worst thing that this flesh or that the enemy can do is take my life, then I'm serving the right God. Because God knows how to take the thing that the devil meant for evil and literally turn it around. So my dead places can become alive again. So my hopeless places can become bastions of hope again. So my weakness can become strength again. So my blindness can become vision again. God knows how to awaken and give us what we need to move from the place of the base of the mountain to the elevated places of revelatory experiences. Come on, let's stand to our feet and let's spend a few moments and invite God to help us make it up the rough side of the mountain. Grab the hand of someone next to you if you don't mind. God, my brother and my sister who I'm touching, I know that life is not unfamiliar to all of us that we all have moments and experiences that cause us to feel like we are having a mountain journey through the rough areas and places of our lives i pray for the person i'm touching right now i pray god that you will give them your strength I pray that you will give them your spirit in abundance. I pray, God, that you will remind them that they are indeed being called out of the crowd, out of their crowd of family or friends or their vocation. You have a unique calling for them to make a journey up the mountain. And I pray, God, that as they make that journey, Lord, that you will meet them there. Meet them at the midpoint, meet them at the 
three quarters point. Meet them at the top, God. Meet them along the way and give them what they need, God, to feel your presence anew. I pray for healing in their life. Somebody say, heal them, Lord. I pray for strength in their life. Somebody say, strengthen them, Lord. I pray for love and peace in their life. Somebody say, give it to them, Lord. And may they always be open to the expansion that comes from you. Now lift those hands right where you're standing. It's me, oh Lord, and I'm standing in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it is not my father, it is not my sister or my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. I need you, God, to fill me up. Fill me up, God, until I can take no more. Fill me with your joy. Fill me with your peace. Fill me with your healing. Fill me with your knowledge. Fill me, God, so I can be faithful to the task you set before me, whether I serve the community through mercy, whether I advocate for systems change through justice work, whether I am simply trying to raise my children and help them navigate the vicissitudes of life in this era. God, whatever I need, may God, my experience with you at the mountain, God, may it be a place of of, of a deep, Lord, filling up so I can overflow. So, God, I can have what I need to literally be in position to experience your glory. I know you're able to do it because you've done it for us time and time again. And so we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them I'm looking for my mountaintop experience. Yes, yes.